Are you looking for a church where love flows because God is in control? A church where God is really real? Hi, my name is Dennis Rogers, pastor here at the Greater New Bible Way Church of God in Christ. I would like to welcome you to our services. <laughs>
strength, God. Thank you for watching us as we slept and slumber all last night, God. Bring us back to this place of worship one more time, God. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, before we ask you for anything, Father, we just want to thank you, Father. We just want to worship you, Father. We just want to praise your name, Father, because you've been so good to us, God. And we just want to say thank you, Father. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. We say yes, God. Have your way, Holy Spirit. In this place, God. In this place, God. Me and the broken hearts, God. You see, you know, God. Meet everyone at the point of their knees. This prayer, I surrender your daughter, son, Jesus. And every glad heart starts shabbatting and clapping and giving God a thunderous praise. Hallelujah. Please remain standing for the Old Testament and New Testament reading. Just, be, just before we do that, the bishop is entering at this time. Let's, let's give him a praise as he comes in on this path. Amen. 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 Come on, you can do better than that. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Keep 
your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. That is Philippians 4 through 7. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We thank God tonight. We give honor to God and to our jurisdictional prelate. Amen. Bishop Frank J. Anderson. Amen. Amen. Great man of God. Amen. We give honor to his staff. All, all these superintendents and these great men of God. We thank God for them. For Lady Anderson, it is so, so good to see you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Lady Strickland, God bless you. Amen. Amen. Uh, and also to Mother Watkins in her absence. To all these pastors and missionaries and, and, and all the saints of God everywhere. Even those that are watching via Facebook Live, we thank God that you're a part of this service tonight. And of course, to our, our chairman. Oh, somebody ought to be yelling right now. Give me a smile. We thank you, Pastor God, for the leadership service. And to this great man of God who is going to break the bread of life on tonight, Superintendent Vaughn. God bless you, sir. I'm looking forward to hearing the word of God tonight. Now that the house has been addressed, it's time for moments of praise. And so if you will, allow the praise to get, I, I tell you what, if the praise gets in you, I'm, I'm told that God will sit down in your praise. Oh, somebody don't believe what I'm saying right now. He will sit down in your praise. And there's nothing like the presence of God where the presence of the saints are. So let's get ready for moments of worship and then we will return. God bless you. Praise the Lord.
that, that he is good and he's good all the time. <laughs> oh, y'all looking at me like you don't know what, he, what, what we're talking about. I, I don't care what has been going on in your life. God has still been good. I, I wish I had just two or three people in here right now. Come on. Come 
looking at somebody and saying, Young, the best you can know, but you're in a sanctified church. And right now, I feel the most sanctified. Let me get the third more chapter, and I'm going to go sit down. One, two, three, four.
time, we're ready for our spotlight on youth and young adults. Amen. Sunday school highlights, the Ministry of Music. Do we have anyone that's doing the spotlight tonight for our youth and young adults? Here we go. All right.
my companion, and to each of you. Chairman Brown asked me to speak on the importance of Sunday school. And I'm just going to be uh, brief with you uh, this evening. As I am not the inspirational speaker, nor I am not the speaker of the hour. But I am going to talk about the importance of Sunday school. And as we prepare to go back in person, Sunday school becomes all the more important. I will not talk down about any of the other ministries in the auxiliaries. But Sunday school is one that you cannot be dismissed from. You are always in it. President Vaughn, I would ask if, if, if I came to you and I can't sing, I can't play an instrument of any kind, I can't even snap my fingers correctly. <laughs> I don't think you could use me in the music ministry. Unless you are and unless you are married to a minister, you can't be in the minister's wife's ministry. Unless you're married to a minister. You can't be in mission or evangelism if you are glued and anchored to your seat. That's spiritually and physically. So they won't be able to use The youth department is going to let you go after a while. Well, I don't know what the age is, but you cannot be eternally in the youth department. Now, even though scripture tells us to put away childish things, and some of us haven't done it, you cannot be in the youth department in marriage. Sunday school is a school that you never graduate from. And that you're always welcome at. You never graduate from it, from it because you will never know everything there is to know. And if you know everything, you think you know everything, you're probably somewhere starting your own church. And your own religion because you know it all. And can't nobody tell you nothing. Sunday school is important because we are the church of God in Christ. The church of God. If we are of God, we need to know God. Yes. Sunday school is an opportunity to get to know God. Yes. It is a wonderful opportunity to get to know God. We're asking, when you come back to church, come back to Sunday school. Bring your children to Sunday school. Bring them to Sunday school and stay at Sunday school. Please stay. You're setting an example of your children. Because if you just bring them and drop them off and you keep pushing, what's the difference between Sunday school and daycare? It is important that we know who God is you can get to know God in Sunday school, Bible band, etc., etc., all the other opportunities that are available. It is important that we know who God is because the world we live in, at some point, the world we live in at some point is going to try and create God. The world that we live in is going to try to tell you that you can't worship your God. And if you don't know who God is, you may fall in either one of those traps. You may be blown to and fro by the winds of the world. No, you will not graduate from Sunday school. But you are to study and show thyself approved. Because there are people in the world who know the word. They don't know God, but they know the Word. Satan. Satan knew the Word. And if you get out there in the world pretending that you know the Word, you're going to run to these, some of these people who know the Word frontwards and back. They're not living it. They know it. Better than some of us. In Sunday school, you got to do the work yourself. You can't look over on somebody else's paper. And you can't Google God. You can ask questions. 
questions in Sunday school. When, when your pastor's preaching, you can't really ask questions then. That's not, that's not time. There's time and place for everything. You learn that in scripture. You learn that in Sunday school. You can question. And, but if you come to Sunday school and you study the word, then you know the word. When your pastor or someone is preaching about something that is not in the word, then you know that it's not in the word. If the speaker is preaching on the ten suggestions, then you know that's wrong. Because God gave us ten commandments. He did not give us ten suggestions. He did not give us ten if you feel like it. He didn't give us ten if somebody seen you do it. He gave us ten commandments. And there were no stipulations on this or that. There were ten commandments. But if you don't know the word, when the speaker is preaching about something that is in the, not in the word, you won't know. If we are in the army of the Lord, then Sunday school is our basic training. It is boot camp. It is where we learn how to use the weapons of God. David didn't put on Saul's armor to fight Goliath and says the scripture because he was not trained in it. If you come to Sunday school, then you are familiar with the weapons. If you don't, you're trying to use weapons you haven't been trained in. Come and get your training. Come and get your training. I say this a lot, but I'm almost done. If you know the word, if you know the word that your Sunday school, wherever you go to church, your Sunday school needs you. Your Sunday school needs you. You know the word. God has placed that word in you for you to teach and witness to other people. And he's told some of you to teach Sunday school. And you just keep ignoring him. If you don't know the word, if you don't know the word, then you need the Sunday school. I want to show you a picture of a man before I take my seat. This man is Dred Scott. Dred Scott was a slave. And in 1857, I teach history, in 1857, the Supreme Court of the United States told Dred Scott several things. Told him that he was not a citizen, and therefore he had no rights to sue anyone. He was in court suing to become a free person. That's what the court said. That's what the world said to him. Okay? The world will tell you lots of different things about you. And I want you to come to Sunday school so that you will know what God says about you. What God says you are. So when the world tells you that you are a victim, you say, no, I'm a victor. When the world tells you that you are defeated, you say, no, 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 I am victorious. When the world tries to make you a borrower, you say, no, I am a lender. When the world tries to give you an apartment in Lodabar, you say, no, that is not for me. What God has for me is for me. If you know who you are, and if you know who you are to God, it won't matter what the world tries to tell you.
choir, the hands of that. Amen. They're doing some singing tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. At this time, we're going further into the service, and it's time for words of inspiration. Coming from Pastor Andrew Smith of the Evangelism Department. And directly following him will be the presentation of our prelate, coming from Bishop Jerome Strickland, in that order. Let's say amen for Pastor Smith. Amen. Christian and Father, we thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Father, how your spirit has already showed up in this place, oh Lord. And I'm asking you, Father, that you would anoint these lips of clay that I may speak words of life. Lord, as I stand behind this sacred desk, I'm asking you, Father, that you let me bring forth a word that your people can use in this day and time. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Truly, we give honor to God tonight. Amen. I got 10 minutes and I ain't talking about sanctified minutes. I'm talking about real minutes. Amen. We thank God. Amen. For We give honor to Bishop. Amen. And his cabinet. Amen. We give honor. Amen. To Mother Watkins and her absent and her cabinet. Amen. We give honor. Amen. To Mother. Amen. Anderson. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. And so I don't get in trouble, I give honor to everyone else, amen, including my wife, amen. We thank God for her, amen. If you would, amen, if you have a Bible, amen, I know we don't have many of these still running around, but if you have one, amen, you can break it out and go to Matthew, the 16th chapter, starting at the 13th verse, amen. This is the only time, well, the two times I allow you to use your phone in my church. One is to look up the scripture, and two is to cash out. Amen. So you're not cash apping, so you can use it, amen, to look up your scripture. Amen. That's Matthew, the 16th chapter, and starting at the 13th verse. And the word of God reads, you mind standing with me for the reading of God's word? When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, and are one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You may be seated. Amen. I want to just speak to you for about eight minutes now on whom say ye that I am. We have to understand that Jesus had a demanding schedule. He traveled, amen, if you look back in the 15th verse, he was in Jerusalem. And he traveled from Jerusalem to Tyre and to Sidon. And then he went back down to Galilee. And we have to understand when you look at your biblical map that Tyre and Sidon and Galilee are countries and not cities. So he traveled through countries. Amen. But when he traveled now, he's in the upper northern region of Galilee, in the mountain near the Mount of Hermon. And in there, he was in Caesarea Philippi. And on his long journeys, we have to understand that Jesus met the needs of people. He healed the lame. He made the blind to see. He even called the dumb to speak. He called the maimed to be healed, but to be put back and made whole. Listen, it says there that he fed even 4,000 on just a few fish and a few loaves. We have to understand that he even had debates with those critical and scheming opponents. Mm -hmm. There was a time that he got weary and sat by a well. Amen. And there was a time that he fell asleep, amen, on a storm, amen. Then he woke up and said, peace. Be still. There was a time when he wanted to get to the other side and Jesus just walked on the water. We know that he had a vigorous opportunity, but now Jesus sometimes had to steal away. And I believe that this is one of those times that the rest of Philippi that he stole away. Amen. Because it says here that he was just with his disciples. So no one else was around. And, and in this opportunity when he was there, there was a lot of notable things happening. There were revelations being made there. Here, he, listen, his deity was revealed and confirmed. His plan for and found the church was re 
explain. He prepared his disciples for his approaching death and questions were raised and answered. But here Jesus asked the question, whom do men say that I am, the Son of Man am? And, and listen, Jesus wanted to know the public's response to his ministry. And how many know that even when we get up and preach, amen, when Bishop gets up every now and then, he wants somebody to respond, amen, to his preaching. We want somebody to say, you have preached a good sermon. We want somebody to tell us, you did a good job. Amen. And Jesus was asking his disciples, whom do they say I am? But these disciples, listen, because they love him, yes. <laughs> they didn't tell him none of the negative stuff. They only came with the positive stuff. I don't know about you, but I read now when they said he was a glutton. Amen. I read his Bible, they said he was a wine beaver. Amen. I read in the Bible where it said he was friends of sinners. I read it that they said he was demon possessed. Amen. There were some negative things going on, but the disciples did not give him any negative. Amen. That's kind of like your wife or your husband ask you a question about how they look. You're going to find something positive in the way they look. If they ask you about their hair, you're going to find something positive about their hair. Because you love them, you're going to find the positive things in them. The disciples love Jesus. So they said, listen, some say that, you, that you're John the Baptist. And some say you're Elias. And some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then they wanted to know, Jesus just wanted to know what was the public opinion. But after they found, he found out what the public opinion was. Now he asked his disciples, whom do you say that I am? Listen, the disciples now are forced <laughs> to now to make a decision. <laughs> they've, been with, they've been with Jesus. They saw him heal. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him feed thousands. Even they was even taught by him. But listen, Peter just stood up and said, Thou art the Christ. Yes. But I'm here to let y'all know tonight that we're all forced faced with this same question today. Yes. We have, listen, we've all seen the lame walk in the church of God in Christ. Yes. <laughs> we've seen the blind eyes open right here in the church of God in Christ. We've seen even the dead come to life right here in the church of God in Christ. So I ask you, whom do you say that Jesus is? Uh, we have a more privilege, we're more privileged than the disciples because we got to see the finished work of Christ. But I, I want to inject a little testimony right here. Amen. I, I, listen, they told me when you get over 60, things start happening to your body. A few years ago, I went to, what, what do you call that doctor I went to? A nephrologist. A man that deals with the kidneys. And then I went in there and he did all this series of tests on my body. But he didn't know that I was on a journey with Jesus. I, while Jesus was walking around, I was walking around with Jesus on the inside. He told me, I went back, he said, listen, you got diabetes. You got lupus. You got high blood pressure. He said, your kidneys are spilling protein over and so you got a kidney disease. He told me all of these things. And as a matter of fact, your cholesterol is high. And I went back. I'm telling y'all something. I'm on a journey. I went back. In, I went back to that office just this past Tuesday. I got all those labs done. But when I went in there, the little Chinese man sitting down beside me. He said, "What you been doing?" functioning right. <laughs> he said, he began to show me my, my lab. And I couldn't wait till I got home to show my wife that everything on my lab was in line. Yeah. They told me when I got 60, I was going to develop some stuff. They told me that if I just stay with God when I turned 60, 
one coming after me who mightier than I. Whose shoes are not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. I speak of none other than that leader since 2009 has promoted the second jurisdiction of Arkansas, both physically and spiritually. I speak of none other than that great leader that we call our brother, our jurisdictional leader, the right reverend, Bishop Frank Jefferson Anderson, Jr. Will you put your hands together and welcome to this podium the Holy Man of God, Bishop Anderson. Praise Him in your own way. 
kind. But I challenge you, when you get up in the morning, push your plate back.
subject just for a uh, 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 message say amen just lean over to somebody and this will probably be the only time I ask you to say something to them but lean over them and tell them this next miracle will need no announcements oh, the Lord. we give great respect and honor to all of you and We've already called the roll several times, but I, I cannot do this because if it had not been for this man, I would be standing here on today. So we celebrate our leader, Bishop. Come on, Bishop Anderson. Amen. 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 for his family. We celebrate all of you and everyone that served under him. That made all of us. I must say, I thank God for this music department. Yeah. All these things are cheering and singing tonight. Amen. Thank you, new commander. You played a great part in it. We certainly celebrate you all for that. We thank you so much. Amen. We thank God. I have to say, I want to thank God for uh, our newly appointed, my assistant pastor. Amen. Pastor Carlton. Amen. Let's celebrate him. Amen. Did a great job of you. And the assistant district missionary is here, Mama Edwards. Amen. We celebrate her. My twin sister was supposed to drive me here, but she jumped on the passenger side. Amen. But I thank you. She is the new appointed district missionary designee of the Damascus North. My twin sister, Chi, I mean, I couldn't say Chi Chi. Uh, missionary Lisa is here. Amen. Thank God for all of you. 
You said it was over. I'm going to get a couple announcements out of the way. Now, we really already had preaching. I do know that. And I know well, many of us have been in the pandemic and we have got used to the hour of services, hour and 15 minute service. And we do know after about an hour and a half, we start checking out. So I'm, I'm not going to preach because they've already preached, but I danced, but I did it all. I'm just going to encourage. But I do want to say something that the music department, amen, we are having a fundraiser and we are trying to break, take some of the expense off of the state because it costs to carry the music department. We have first class musicians. Come on, we have first class. And so I look forward to the music table, amen. We have a fundraising popcorn. I know some of y'all say I don't need popcorn and, and all that. But if you can leave a donation, amen. You don't have to work through us. If you will use a QR code, amen, they'll send directly to your house. Directly to your house, amen. So if you will see us out there. Also, the choir is not just for young people. Amen. So we've been asking, we've been asking, if, 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 we could just sound like Bishop Anderson, if, 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 if. <laughs> Uh, if we could get about five people from each district, I believe that we can have a hundred voice part for the state convocation. Yeah. Amen. So we want to encourage you, encourage you that direct the uh, rehearsals are out in the foyer. Amen. We will give you more information on that. And finally, amen, Chairman Brown said we only have just a few t-shirts, so if you will register, amen, to help the AIM convention, amen, and get your t-shirt to wear at home, amen. I know sometimes we get these t-shirts and after it's over, you don't know what to do with them, amen. That's all right, paint them, do something, man, amen. We're in the yard, we certainly want you to support, amen, Chairman Brown. This particular story, if you allow me, this particular story, amen, uh, it was a blessing to me. Uh, talking about J. Iris. J. Iris. J. Iris was uh, a ruler of the synagogue. Uh, the ruler of the synagogue. He, he worked in the church. He served in the church. And the Bible said that he had a daughter and his daughter was sick. Anytime the Bible talks about a daughter, it's talking about something that's supposed to reproduce. Something that's supposed to be reproducing. And the Bible says that at the age of 12, when she was at the right age to produce, she gets sick. I don't know if anybody in here ever had something that God gave you, and right when it should have been a blessing to you, it got sick. Many of us have things in our lives. Many of us have our ministries. Amen. Look like right now, God, I've been preaching for a long time. I've been serving you for a long time. And what should be blessing me now, it looks like it's about to die. And there are some of us that have been in marriages and, 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 and you've been married a long time. You love her, she loves you, y'all love each other. But it looks like the fire have gone out in the marriage. And, and you're saying, God, this is supposed to be a blessing to me right now. But look like it is dying. Now, I have to preach like this because all the time we get in the church and we act like everything is okay. We have to come in and look like we got it all together. We have to come in and if you say anything about what you're going through, people will tell you you don't have faith. Well, it's not that I don't have faith. I'm just being real. Everything, everything, sometimes it's not all right. And so, and so J. Iris, he works in the church, and right now we would call him nowadays, we would call him a minister, and the minister or the preacher had a problem. And the Bible says that he goes to Jesus and besought him and begged him that he would come and lay hands on his daughter that she may be healed and live. That she may be healed and live. Let me pause right there for a moment because a lot of us have been healed, but we don't know how to live. Just because you're here in the church don't mean that church has got to be the only thing that you know. You better learn how to live. This is why we're stressing out because we act like the church folk is the only people and the only thing that we know. You better learn how to go take a vacation. You better learn how to enjoy your family. You better take some time with your children. I'm going to talk to this side over here. You better take some time with your family members and not just church members. You better learn how to live. And all the time, if you flip that same coin, many of us have learned how to live, but we ain't healed. Many of us are preaching, but we ain't been healed. Many of us are getting license to be missionary, but we ain't healed. And if you don't get healed, that thing will filter over into your ministry. So not only do I want God to 
to teach me how to live, I need God to heal me. I came up in the church where it was a church of healing. And, 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 and so, and so, and so, I'm, I'm moving. And so the Bible, the Bible said that, she, that he besought him, meaning that he begged him. And I know the church says that we don't have to beg God for anything, but you have to understand Jay Iris from his standpoint. Him begging God didn't mean that I didn't doubt him. His begging God has said, I need you to do it right now. Is there anybody in here need God to do something right now? I wish we could just get out of this church moment and just grab this. I need God to do something right now. I, I need him to do it right now. Wow. I'm sitting up in church. I need you to do it right now. I got a son that's on drugs, and I need God to do something right now. My money is funny, and my change is strange, and I need God to do it right now. Somebody shout right now, right now, right now. And so he went, and he begged. He begged Jesus. He begged Jesus. Even the temptation had enough sense to say and sing a song and say, I'm not too proud to beg. But see, the thing that I want to say this God, uh, the thing that I want to say about this was that he begged Jesus, but he didn't try to manipulate him. I, I, let, me, let, me, let me pause for the cause because I need you to understand something. See, oftentimes when we need something from God, we think we're praying, but we're really manipulating. See, see, Mary and Martha went to Jesus and sent for Jesus and said that Lazarus, that one that you love it, is sick. And, and I thought that that was a compliment to Jesus, but I found out that they were trying to manipulate him. Why would you say that, God? Let me, let me explain to you. Because why would you tell Jesus, the one that you love, when you are Jesus already know that he loved him? They had a relationship. Mary started out with an attitude because she doesn't wash Jesus' hair with her feet with his her hair. And when she called on Jesus, Jesus didn't come. So Mary sits up with an attitude, and when they try to get Jesus to come, they say, the one you love, let me say it the way we were saying now, they, if you love him like you say you love me, God, then I need you to come when I call you. And we've been taught, we've been taught, because we have to understand that sometimes it's not that we don't have information, we just been have misinformation. We said things like this sometimes. You got to remind God. You got to remind God. I preach it. I said it. You got to remind God. But anytime you feel like you got to remind God, it's a spirit of manipulation. Why would you have to remind God? Why would you have to remind God? When he said, I'll bring all things to y'all. Remember, you ain't got to remind him. He ought to be reminding you. It's a spirit. It's a spirit of manipulation. I need you to do it right now. I need you. Anyway, let me get out of that. And, and so they try to manipulate him. And so we all know the sermon. Let me fast forward. Mary sits up with an attitude. She sits up because she couldn't control the narrative. And anytime we ask God to do something and God don't do it, the way we think he ought to do it, we'll sit up with an attitude because we can't control the narrative. But what you got to understand about God is God can see the same thing but also see two, two different things in the same situation. But it's all based on the positioning of where you're sitting. Where you sit tells you what you see and what you see will tell you what you do. The Bible said that God sits high and he looks low. So in other words, you see the corner but God sees around the corner. You see today and God already see to tomorrow. See tomorrow. So now you got an attitude with God because God ain't moving like you want him to move because God sees further than you. What you got to understand that when God is doing something, he's doing something. And when God is doing nothing, he's doing something. Anytime God is doing nothing, he's doing it intentionally. And so when God is doing something, he's doing something. And when he's doing nothing, he's doing something. The enemy wants you to be angry at God when you think God ain't doing nothing because you, he, he said that now God is not doing it for you. But you, what you got to understand is that when God is not doing nothing, he's doing something. Therefore, you got to learn how to praise God when you can't see what he's doing. I wish I had five people in here but to just celebrate God for what he's about to do, what, what he's about to do, what he's about to do. I want you to praise him for, for what you can't see. I don't know how you're going to heal me, but I'm going to praise him like I already got it. I don't know how you're going to save my son, but I'm going to praise him like I already got it. I don't know how you're going to snatch me out of this, but I'm going to praise him like I already got it. So, so let me 
control. And you know the rest of the story. Jesus sent for Mary. She sent for Mary. And when he sent, when he sends for Mary, he says to Mary, he says, show me where he lies. Y'all know the rest of the story. But what I want you to get out of this entire story was, if Mary hadn't come, she wouldn't have got the, they wouldn't have got the miracle. It was only when she released control that she got the miracle. Could it be that you ain't getting the miracle because you won't let go and let God? So J. Iris, J. Iris, he begs Jesus. He begs Jesus, and the Bible said, and Jesus went with him. And Jesus went with him. And all of a sudden, while he's going, uh, Brother Hilson touched on it last night, and I don't want to deal with the obvious. I want to deal. I, th th there was a woman that had an issue. Of blood. Yes, and, and, and she interrupts the flow. Yeah. She, she's got an issue of blood and she comes to Jesus. Now the first question I want to ask is if the woman had an issue and if any of us understand the Bible that any time that you had a blood flow you weren't supposed to be around the cry. Right. You weren't supposed to. So my question is how did she get from where she was to Jesus without everybody seeing? Because the Bible says she thrown him meaning it suggests to us that she had to hide her issues to get to Jesus. Yeah. I wonder how many of us ever had to hide our real issues. Yeah. I'm going to go back on this side over here. Yeah. How many of us had to hide some issues to get to Jesus? Because if you came in a church and the church people knew what you were really dealing with, I'm not talking about your church testimony. I'm not you sitting up there being hypocritical like you got everything all right. But I want to talk to some people that got some stuff that you still on your knees and out. That if it had not been for God on your side, that thing would have taken you out. If it had not been for the Holy Ghost to keep you, who am I preaching to? You? And as she had her issues, y'all know the story. She touched the hem of his garment. But I don't want to focus on the woman. I need you to focus on Jairus. Because Jairus had a situation that was about to die. And he goes to Jesus and he asks Jesus because Jairus worked in the church. So Jesus is supposed to work for me. This woman don't even know Jesus. And she comes up and gets in front of me and gets the blessing. The Bible says she touched him, and the Bible says that as she touched him, immediately, immediately the blood drew up. Watch this. Watch Jairus' attitude. Because Jairus should have had an attitude because most of us would have. I know she didn't. I've been waiting on God to do this. She don't even know it. She, she going to come up in here at the last minute, and she going to come and get the blessing. Wait a minute. First of all, Jesus, she didn't even call you. I did it. Second of all, she tried everybody but you. And here she is getting in front of me to get my miracle. And the Bible says that the virtue left him. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're just working for about five more minutes. The virtue left him. And the Bible says that Jesus turns around now and have a conversation. Wait a minute, Jesus. My situation is almost dead. And I need you to move right now. I can only talk to some people that need God to move right now. My situation is almost dead. And God, you're standing here and didn't have the nurse, the audacity to have a conversation and begin to prophesy. Jesus turned around and said, now don't touch me. Now Jesus, now you know all these folks around you, all these folks around you. And you said something, now somebody had to touch me because the healing person left my body. The healing person left my body. And they won't talk. Okay, Jesus, I did it. Oh, you touched me. Me, your faith or hate made you whole. And Jay Iris stands there. He stands there in me. I'm almost finished, y'all. He stands there in me. And all of a sudden, he just stood there patiently. Because I need to tell somebody in here the problem is not that you're not going to get your answer, it's your attitude by your way. I didn't come in here just to preach. I came to tell somebody your attitude. It's your hold up. If you learn to just trust God, I said, if you learn to just trust God, and, and, and so and so the woman gets healed, and then the Bible says that as the woman gets healed, Jesus leads her, and they go on. Now, now watch this, watch this, watch this. As Jesus is getting ready to leave, the people came up to him and asked him a question. I'll begin to make a statement. It says to him, said, Master, uh, 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 sir, your daughter is dead. Why 
troubleth the master any further. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble him any further? Why keep bothering Jesus? It's over. Why do you keep bothering Jesus? They done told you you passed a certain age. It's supposed to happen. Why do you keep praying about it? They, they locked up now. Why do you keep bothering Jesus? Why, why, why? You see, she done got strung out. Ain't nothing going to change. It nothing going to happen. Why keep bothering Jesus? Why, why keep praying for your church? You can't get folks to come back after COVID and look like you ain't got the two folks and they ain't got enough to pay the bill. Why do you keep praying? Why do you keep bothering Jesus? Why keep troubling the master, why keep trouble? The doctor done told you that it's all over and you might as well give up. But why keep troubling the master? Why keep trouble? I need to find somebody that don't mind keep troubling the master. It does not matter what they say. It does not matter what they think. It does not matter how they like you. I need you to just elbow somebody and say keep troubling, keep troubling. The master, the Bible says that as soon as Jesus heard it, as soon as Jesus heard it, as soon as Jesus heard it, he said two words, fear not. I didn't understand that. That didn't make sense to me. I said, okay, he says fear not, why not? Because Jairus had enough faith for Jesus to heal the girl. But because he knew Jesus as a healer, but he didn't know him, and know him as a resurrector. And what Jesus did before somebody got in his ear and began to make him lose faith, Jesus stopped him right in the track and said, fear not. I don't know who I'm talking to in here. You got the wrong folks in your ear when you're trying to get a miracle. When you need God to do something in your life, you got the wrong folks in your ear. And as I close, as I close for you, as I close, so I
here. But I need some of y'all to understand that this next season God is about to take you in. You got to pull out everybody that don't believe what you believe. You got to pull out every conversation that don't believe what you believe. If the doctors have diagnosed you with something, don't run around and tell everybody. You got to learn how to pull them out. into the room and Jesus lifted her up and he gives her to the parents and he says one phrase he says don't tell nobody some of y'all talk too much I'm try it over here. Some of y'all talk too much. There's some stuff you ain't got to tell nobody. This next miracle, you ain't got to announce it. I said, God is going to let them see for themselves. This next miracle, you ain't got to say nothing. God is going to let them see for themselves. This next miracle, you ain't got to post it on Facebook. You ain't got to put it on Instagram. You ain't got to put it on Snapchat. All you got to do is do what God told you to do. And I can't say this without having something to back it up. Can y'all give me about one more minute? Let me get more. Why can I back say this without backing it up? You remember when Paul and Silas was in jail and we get hacked on that part about at midnight and they pray and at midnight and they pray. That's good. That's the obvious. But watch this. The Bible says that while they were locked up in prison, they prayed and sang praises. They prayed and sang praises. Now watch this. The Bible says as they prayed and sang praises, the prisoner began to shake. There was an earthquake in, in, in the prison and it shook everything to loose. I've got to prophesy to somebody. God's about to shake some stuff in your life. God's about to shake some stuff in your life. God's about to shake some stuff in your life. Don't touch your neighbor. Tell yourself. God's about to shake some stuff. Everybody 
Sandra.